Indeed. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible podcast. And today we're going to talk about something that just... I thought about it the other day. Or I thought about like it. Like for the first time? Not necessarily for the first time. But every time I think about it, it just blows my mind just the concept of it and eating that, souls well I'm, cu- I'm trying to cut back you know I'm trying to lose weight and stuff okay but no 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 but uh, we can link to to both Hank and John talking about it in various uh, they have two different yeah um, YouTube videos that inspired this a little bit but just the the thought of public education as a concept, the idea that people, and lot of children, but people... Ch- children can, are people. Children are people, <laughs> but I don't want to conflate with adults when I say people. Uh, but where youth go to a place that's subsidized and paid for, where they get to learn stuff for like six to eight hours a day. And then may or may not have extracurriculars, co-curriculars, and whatnot. Like just when you think about it, it's just for everything else that we experience in our lives, and that we pay for, or that we have to, you know, work to bring about. This is something, at least. Uh, so, and obviously, this is going to be heavily. Um, this is going to all be about in our experiences in Canada, in Ontario, kind of deal. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about stateside, but the, there's not really an appreciable difference in terms of the idea of public education between Canada and the States for a child going to school. Curriculum might be different. Uh, funding might be different, but otherwise mm-hmm. like there's still the idea that you go to a public school or you go to, you have a publicly funded education available to you. That's compulsory. Sure. It's compulsory, but just, a, just a concept public education. It's just amazing to me. But I'm kind of nerdy like that. I like being in school. And my parents threatened that if I were to become a career student, that that would be very bad, <laughs> have very bad consequences for their support. Yes, it of would. Me. So, be damned. I love I love the idea of going to school in public education. It's awesome. Especially once you enter the workforce and you're like, I just want to go back and do really? school. I'm the total opposite. I do not miss being in university one bit. I like the time it affords uh, like like i like for one thing i like my job but also um i like the notion that when i leave my job i can more or less put it down you know i can sort of keep an eye on it but you know let it say sim- it simmers but um i can i'm sort of free to do the things that i want to do like podcasts whereas with with often with the university i i found that that it was like whenever I was doing anything else, I could always have been writing papers. Mm -hmm. And that was a sort of consistent present thing. But there's a lot of things like I I don't enjoy being constantly evaluated um, in texts. The constantly evaluated. But regardless, I do think that public education is extraordinarily invaluable. Yeah. Um, For that matter, Icebreaker, who is your favorite teacher? I have to say... Specifically, when when, when I I guess when we talk about public education in context, what, what, what we mean is like, primary and secondary education not right. university or college which is post secondary which while partly publicly funded also requires people to uh, pay and more importantly it is designed mostly to educate people who are mostly adults and not children mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. so but yeah favorite teacher go i would say it'd have to be mr steffler who i believe you talked about in the philosophy stories podcast i believe so yeah he was uh, he was integral to my my philosophical story or my story about my my history of philosophy history with philosophy anyways um yeah mr steffler was my uh grade 11 writer's craft teacher uh he was also the head of the english department uh taught lit studies taught various core english courses you know 9 through 12 at various times uh also ran a i want to call it a remedial but it was kind of like a remedial class. It was, it was just a, a session where kids who were having problems with the LP could get um, uh, more practice cool. in in the elements that they needed help with. And it was an actual class. It wasn't like an after-school program. It was a class specifically devoted to the people who required a little bit of extra coaching to help them mm-hmm. with, with the concepts in the LPs, which were the standardized uh, English examinations. Um, 
So, anyways, uh, yeah, Mr. Steffler, he, I took his writer's craft, writer's craft course, and did really well, you know, mid eighties, uh, and loved it so much I took it a second time. <laughs> and when I tried to take it, my guidance counselor was like, "Are you trying to improve the grade?" I was like, no, no, I just really liked it. I really liked his style. He was the kind of teacher. I don't know. Maybe he was aspiring to some sort of um, uh, dead poet society thing. He would walk into a class, write a poem on the board silently. He wouldn't say anything to us. Just come in, start writing a poem on the board, turn around, and then just say respond and give us ten minutes to respond to it in some way, anyway. So you could write a poem in response. You could critique the poem. Usually, he preferred it when it was some sort of po poetic response or some sort of creative response. I mean, it was a writer's craft course. Wasn't a lit cri uh, crit or critical theory course kind of deal. Mm -hmm. um, he was that kind of uh, teacher, and uh, he did things with the English language that I didn't know you could do in terms of um, opening up meaning and symbolism and allusions to other texts. He introduced me to the concept of um, hypertextuality, mm -hmm. uh, and actually, he wanted to go back and finish his master's thesis in hypertextuality in terms of like liter literature hypertexting um, through the work and that was what ended up giving me um, or setting me in the direction that you know what like I don't have to go down the hard sciences there is something interesting that can be explored through um, English and then eventually for me philosophy so he was my uh, favorite teacher scared the hell out of me because sometimes I couldn't tell if he was angry with us or if he was trolling us when he was being stern and serious <laughs> um, but yeah he's he's my favorite teacher and Jim who was your favorite teacher oh man I was uh, I was not a good student in school I got thrown in high school like three times uh, mostly for not showing up to class but yeah as I think back over favorite teachers my mine are also all like basically all English teachers Mr. Thompson was a great science teacher but I didn't start really being cool with him until because um, I was busy being a high school jerk kid um, until until I met him when I was outside of high school. He, he used to shop in my convenience store all the time because he lived in the neighborhood and he was retired and it was a super good time. But no, I mean I, I didn't ha I didn't have a chance to get a, not to, to know a lot of teachers because I was so busy getting kicked out of school. Um, I did have a couple of really good English teachers, uh, Mr. Puidas, who is a Finnish Canadian uh, guy from like northern ontario northern quebec somewhere around there and he i i just remember him as being this guy of quiet intensity that i really wanted to take seriously which is usually exactly when he would crack a joke um but probably mr fisher um and it wasn't even because he was my he was my seventh grade english teacher and that was the first time that I'd ever had, like, multiple classes where we had to, like, run around and have a schedule and manage a locker and all the kinds of other crap. Because we were in junior high, and apparently that's what you do in junior high. But uh, he gave us an assignment once where it was, like, one of those sort of stupid unit assignments where it's like, here, here's 30 different activities you could do that are vaguely English-related. Make a cover in pencil crayon. Do seven of them. Hand them in. Please, God. Um... And I don't know, but it was all about sort of introspection. And I was a quietly introspective child um, who grew up into a loud, introspective adult. And one of the section was, sections was on questioning me, it was called. And it was, it was like, you know, ask questions and try and think about the answers. And a lot of people, I, I, I got to, we did a bit of peer review and I got a chance to look at people's questions and a lot of people are just like sent in a list of questions um for that and like question like one through three you know, on, on everybody's sheet was invariably why do i have to go to school which i thought was really stupid even at the time because there are tons of great reasons why you have to go to school for one thing what would you do at home all day i didn't have television um i knew about it but i didn't have it um but mine was I wrote this tiny little paper, like like three paragraphs on why do I have feelings and why are they confusing? And and why do I think about stuff in the way that I do? And he really liked it. And we had a long talk about it once. Um, 
I believe my guidance counselor was involved. <clears throat> the uh, the brief paragraphs paragraphs included a Descartes quote. Um, <laughs> co- the the cogito cogito ergo sum the Descartes never actually said yeah. or wrote anywhere, but everybody quotes him for because I mean I mean like if I if if I am the sum of my thoughts and my thoughts are really confusing, then what does that make me? Um, I had read that quote not in Descartes but uh, in a Bruce Coville book about. Um, kids solving mysteries uh, very recently at the time and uh, thought it would be a good thing to include because it was a thing that I was thinking about um, and he, he delighted in it probably because he's like how on earth do you know who Descartes is you're 12 but yeah we had this we had this sort of long it was it was the first time I had ever had an adult like I think it was the first time I'd ever written something that felt real and it was the first time I'd ever had an adult treat something that I had read like it was real, or treat something that I had written rather like it was real, like that. It, like it, it, he he wasn't when he wanted to talk about it, he wasn't just um trying to you know talk about the grade or or, or tell me that it was a really good paper or, or something like that. Paper is the wrong word, but the, the really good you know assignment. He was trying to help me negotiate the opacity of the world and and the the distance that I felt from me to other people which didn't work very well partly because I wasn't super receptive to it but as an adult I look back and I recognize that and I'm like here is a human being who when I was really really uncertain and frightened and nervous and expressed that in writing he read it and he didn't just grade it he really read it and that was super cool i've had a lot of great teachers but uh, in school i was i'm not one of those people who can blame uh their their lack of success in in secondary or in, in like in high school on bad teachers i had great teachers i was just a jerk and didn't go to class also if you were a kid and you were listening to this go to class I have to say, my failures in uh, secondary school was not because I was a jerk, but because I got really lazy. And uh, that's, I mean, that's why I, didn't I do that become, too. That's because I didn't, that was the reason why I didn't become an engineer, actually, was because my, my grades in the maths and sciences started to slip. That's, that seems reasonable. I mean, I mean, to be fair, if you are a, la- a philosopher and you are lazy, you take more naps and get less done. If you are an engineer and you are lazy, people could die. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it reminds me of a joke that somebody mentioned about, you know, being a foot off and something else. Nobody really cares, but being a foot off an engineer and bridges fall down. Yeah. And they have iron rings to commemorate the wrong word, but to remind themselves of. Yeah, of the, the, the sort of responsibility you get. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that is our, that is our. Our favorite teacher icebreaker, yeah. Our school background is pretty, pretty sim- like similar. I think we, we we both went to mostly Canadian public schools. Yep, I did a two year stint stateside, one year in Kansas for the sixth grade, mm-hmm. and one year in Texas for seventh grade. And then I returned back to Ontario for um, eight all the way up. Nice. So uh, Ryan graduated with reasonable distinction, I believe, with a victory lap. Yeah, I mm-hmm. uh, just was not ready to enter. The real world, as it were, which is the exact same answer I gave for why I went into grad school. Um, it is, but it was, it was, yeah. I just I hit grade twelve, and I still did not have a real grasp of what I was going to move on to, uh, and I wasn't ready to move on. So I started my victory lap, my OAC grade thirteen year, and I got through the first ter- or semester. It would have been I got through the first semester. And realized I had outgrown high school and I was ready to move on. And then the second second semester was terrible because I felt completely confined. I think by that <laughs> point I'd already received my acceptance from UW and I accepted it kind of deal. So now it was just marking time before leaving. Yeah. Um, I mean, I still went to school. I didn't drop out for the second semester, but it's just I, I I distinctly remember the feeling that the pond was no longer as large as i thought it was like the, i had outgrown that pond i was ready to move on from high school uh in the second semester but i didn't feel that in the first semester of my my victory lap so i am i am basically the opposite uh i never finished high school i have a ged a general education diploma that i got when i was about 23 
is that I was working in a bunch of places and I say and I saved up and I was like okay I have just enough money to write my GED and like get to it was out of town so I had to go out of town with no car <laughs> um so I remember I spent the night in a Tim Hortons reading Moby Dick and and wrote my GED and I remember the first day joking about how easy it was. It was really easy for me. Uh, I'm, it turns out I am not stupid. Um, but and I joked about it the first day, and then I, I, I realized on the second day that a lot of people were so really nervous about it. And despite the fact that it was really easy for me, it was really challenging for them, and it was a thing that, that was really making them nervous. Um, and that that is why I found it so easy is because it is it is not designed to like be a crucible that you pass through that is difficult. It is designed to give you a certification that you need in order to move on to the things that you the other things you need to do. I mean, it would be years until I actually went to university, I think. But that was that was my my I I, I got tossed out three times, mostly for not going to class. Uh, once because. I was going to job interviews because I needed to pay bills and once because of uh, sedition which is a charge I do not comprehend how it could happen in high school but that was what was on my paperwork so that's what we're going with but yeah it was uh, it was a thing I regret some of those decisions but at the same time they would they they necessarily con contribute to the human being that I am so I can't really get that mad mm -hmm. i can get pretty mad actually but i can't i can't go back and change them without risking everything and also owning a time machine yeah Unless but I'm doing the very thing that that, that that would make me that would make me want to go to go and change them yes paradoxes this is rush shut up but that is my that's uh, that is my school background is remarkably shut different sonic screwdriver uh, i also failed the seventh grade yeah yes uh, that seventh grade where Mr. Fisher was my English teacher, uh, despite his best efforts, I did very little and gave no effort in many of my other classes, and I failed. Uh, and the school was gracious enough to um, let me do grade seven and grade eight in one year as long as I got my marks up, which I did because it turns out I wasn't stupid. I was just lazy and I didn't like things. Um, I was also diagnosed with depression, which was great. Um, the treatment for which, uh, by the way, as for for twelve year old Jim, was uh, small doses of antidepressants and karate, um, which worked remarkably well. I had a really good sensei. But uh, yeah, I mean, so our, our our school background is different, but I think we are both greatly appreciative of public education because I would presumably be in jail. And Ryan would probably be the same person, only a farmer. Something like that, yeah. Something useful, as a, I suppose, as compared to what I sometimes think of myself as doing. Yeah, I mean, you you were well. I mean, you 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 have given a lovely talk about the the lofty ideals of public education as an investment in the future of the youth of our nations. Yeah, I mean, it, when when you think about it. There, there's the the kind of party line that gets touted nowadays in the modern economy that education is ultimately in service of jobs, um, which okay, it's a necessary evil of the situation in which we find ourselves, but it's not the one that inspires the awe in me as opposed to, and I will fully admit like this is kind of an ideal or a fictionalized historical view of things that's probably very far from reality but when i think of public education when i when i kind of hold the concept in my mind it serves to create the future innovators the future movers and shakers which will shape the world in which we will progress towards and then um eventually when i die and you know it's like the future that will keep going forward like that's just an awesome concept to me you know the astronauts and the people exploring or there's still areas of our planet that we still haven't explored you yep. know so i mean just the exploration uh being able to do new cool things with technology being able to eliminate previous problems that you know had held us back for 
uh, you know, practical economical reasons, you know, like food, you know, now imagine, you know, the innovation that'll go into perhaps one day solving food problems. Again, like it's an idealized thing because, you know, obviously human interests are going to get in the way and greed's going to get in the way and, you know, uh, intellectual property in some sense will get in the way, you know, like the, the laws and stuff can get in the way of these ideals. Um, but it still like fills me with a sense of awe. And then the, the other side of it is just this kind of quasi historical, probably not true, but the idea laid down, say in the, um, uh, with the, how the American educational system was conceived, you know, the idea of education, educating the demos, educating the people to be able to, um, make informed decisions to s not just self govern, but self direct themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you don't want, uh, you don't want a stupid uninformed populace, which, you know, you might have opinions of people nowadays being that way, but, you know, having the ability to access public libraries which i think i've ranted about before the concept of a public library is amazing just this building with books that as long as you have an address i guess or somewhere you know you can sign up for a card you know the page master style thing that's a magic you know access into this world that you know yep. unlimited i don't even think you need an address no i don't yeah now that i think about it, you probably don't even need to no you just need like what one piece of id yeah or something like that anyways uh, so there's one one hurdle that you'd have to cross over and have a piece of ID, um, but you know that 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 concept is amazing. And so public education, just this idea that it is a fully subsidized, fully subsidized. Those were air quotes. Yeah, air quotes for those listening. Uh, thing that children and young adults can go to to enrich their minds, to interact socially, to uh, make mistakes, learn things about themselves, learn things about the world, uh, figure things out as well as you know receiving receiving information. They can also figure it out for themselves. It's just it's an amazing concept. It's just an amazing concept to me. I, I just I don't know why necessarily. It just blows my mind. My it's, so what in the pre-show we we learned that Ryan's experiences with public education have been reasonably idyllic um as you can no doubt tell i am i am a little i i am i i share i share many of those ideas but i am not awed by them the thing that i love about public education is what it does to human beings i mean it it, it sort of the practice of public education sort of fundamentally alters you and sets up your social dynamics and things like that. I mean, that's why it's so different from culture to culture. But in the, in the sense that it is really easy to be an adult who uh, never reads Emily Dickinson or Jane Austen or, you know, Moby Dick. Who is not an author? That is the title of the book. Mm -hmm. Just, just, just in case you are one of those adults. Melville, you're cool. Yeah, Herman Melville, good book. But it is really easy to be an adult who's never done that. It is harder now with the internet, but even still, it is pretty easy to be an adult who who does not read those things, or who does not interact with you know history, even 20th century history. You know, the First World War, the Second World War. Uh, the Great Depression, you know, with ancient history, with other languages, with complex mathematics. It is easy to be an adult and never, ever interact with these things. It is, in fact, the most often thing that I find complained about when, with regard to public education on the internet is, now that I'm an adult... I don't ever interact with these things anymore. Why did I learn these? Because one, because when you were a kid, you might fucking want to. And the only way for you to learn that is to interact with them briefly, is to read great books and great poems and listen to great music and learn history and you know, spend time with other languages and spend time with the sciences. And yes, a bunch of that stuff you're going to... 
best hate or not care about and at worst I guess hate but if you are going to be a person who really likes it it is important that you have the opportunity to like it I I'm okay with a world where there are lots and lots of adults who don't read Emily Dickinson as long as that is a world where there are very few adults who have never read Emily Dickinson or similar poets or you know studied other cultures or other languages like it is oh it is one thing to look at a thing see what it is and walk away from it because you got to make a choice about that you got to decide that history wasn't a thing you cared about you got to decide that french was not a language for you if you never got exposed to that then you never got to pick. You don't know if French is not the language for you because you never, like, like forget never even trying, you never even saw it. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't know about whether or not you would like to play an instrument or sing in a choir or play on a sports team or anything like that if, if, if we didn't give you these opportunities. The advantage... The thing I like about public education is no matter how badly it does this, it, like, in in execution, it is, you know, let's call it fair and middling, Mm -hmm. but it tries to give children as many of these opportunities as it can over the course of, like, 14 or 15 years so they can try and figure out the people they're going to be. That is why the dominant concept of of school is what are you going to be when you grow up? You know, you you are one day going to leave this place where we enforce all of this variety and diversity and breadth on you and you need to decide what kind of person you're going to be. Are you going to be a person who wants to do all of this? Are you going to be a person who wants to do some of it? Are you going to be a person who wants to do nothing with it and just forget all of it? I mean, all of those are valid kinds of people. They're all there's a huge spectrum of those people. But if you never got that chance, then you only get to be one of those people. Mm-hmm. The one who gets nothing at all. I mean, that is that to me is the cool thing about public education. And it is also the sucky thing because it means you wind up doing a bunch of stuff that you don't care about or even like. My nieces are in that phase right now, and they're only in, like, the... Gwen's in the fifth grade. And she's like, I hate school. And Alice is like, I hate school, too, because Alice hates whatever Gwen hates, usually. Um, Also, Alice might also hate school. They're in that I hate school phase, because school for them is a burden. It's a thing that they do when they're not playing, and, like, it's the thing that happens in between recess. Uh, and I remember talking to them and saying, hey, do you guys do you guys argue a lot? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, do you guys like being right? They're like, yeah. I'm like, guess what? If you don't stay in school, welcome to the universe of being wrong all the time. I still haven't made them like school. But, I mean, they're learning things that they do like mm-hmm. in school. And they're learning to do those things. And they're learning to do them with other people. And they're learning to do them alone. They're learning to do them with supervision. Like they're learning, I mean, they're learning how to exist in power structures as weird and problematic as those power structures can get. If all of that stuff excites me about public education. That is the thing that matters is that we, we have tried to give people a chance and what, all we can do with that is try harder. Mm-hmm. I would love to live in a, in a nation that is full of people who want to embrace the breadth and diversity of topics and history and, and science and engineering and I would love to be one of those people too. I I like it, but I am a dabbler, and I would like to know more, and I would like to work harder at it. Um, and I would love to live in a country of people like that. I'm okay with not living that in that way, as long as I mean they had a really good opportunity to make a choice. Also, I, you know, school makes people. I don't want to say more complete, but happy. I mean, in the long run, mm-hmm. that is. What do you want to be when you grow up? Happy. Whole. You know? C.
seems legit. The other cool thing about school is that it assaults you with a whole bunch of problems that you solve. Yeah, that was a you posed it in a really interesting way in the in the pre-show, and I like that. I like the concept of it because it also dovetails, and we'll probably link it over my face when Hank Green gave a discussion. That is where I link stuff. Yep. Uh, when he talks about education as giving you tools for problem solving, I like the way you framed it this way: of public education is where we give you twelve to thirteen years of problems in this incredibly wide variety yep. of sub-disciplines. So not just the sciences, not just history, perhaps philosophy. I like when you're like the maths, the advanced maths, the advanced, advanced maths, then calculus, which is the advanced, advanced, advanced math. Like it was, <laughs> I, 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 quite, I quite enjoyed that. But I like that idea. And I challenge, I often challenge, um, there's a meme that floats around every once in a while of like, why did I have to study algebra? And um, and this is, that was one of the things that kind of inspired my thinking. In addition to the the, the two Green Brothers uh, education uh, YouTube videos from their Vlog Brothers channel, mm-hmm. um, but it's the idea that um, you know, like I don't use algebra, and it's like I, I I call bullshit on that because if you're sitting there trying to figure out how what time you should get ready if you're gonna be driving somewhere, you're doing algebra. You're yep. solving essentially for x for a variable. You're solving for a variable. I mean you're. It would, it would, you would be more efficient, probably, if you'd written it down as an algebraic formula than just trying to ballpark it in your head, okay? <laughs> but it's not necessary. It's so, not necessary. So, for- Ryan, I leave work at 4.30, and it takes me an hour to walk home, and my girlfriend leaves work at, at a different location at 4.45. It takes her half an hour to walk home, and our roots cross, but where do we cross? <laughs> No, I know we can we can make light of it. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I but but you are absolutely right. But I mean, like I call bullshit on on stuff like that. I mean, you know what? You may not be using calculus for your the job in which you get paid for. You may not be using calculus in order to live your day to day lives. That's granted. What is so amazing about public education or just education in general is that you are given exposure to problems which starts to build a toolbox of tools in which you can then go to solve unique problems in the future. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is like where people tend to be like, well, Shakespeare is not important. Like, okay, okay, I can grant math is going to be important, right? You can see some sort of utility of math in the real world or science or whatever, but Shakespeare, obviously not. And I, I call bullshit on that too. I mean, it's not going to help you. I don't know. It's not going to help you in physics, but it understanding the 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 kind of connection between the characters what the story is ultimately about can help you relate with other people yeah it can help you understand stories it can help you understand plots it can help you understand you know hubris and why why characters fall or why characters are triumphant you can see where you know just traits make people utterly crap you know what i mean like obviously you're going to have to do a little bit of work. You're going to have to exert some mental sweat in order to get something out of it. It's not going to give you the answers by reading it. I mean, most of the time when you expo- ex- ex- are exposed to Shakespeare, you have to decode the the, uh, the written word in order to understand what's going on. You often yeah. need the guidance of a teacher to help you. I'm mm-hmm. not saying that Shakespeare is supposed to be transparent in that regard, but when you start to actually exert that mental sweat and you build those tools to be able to understand it, it gives you access into understanding how other people are and then you can put yourself into their shoes and you can understand the world from their point of view or you can use it as a framing device to approach situations so education exposes you to these problems and it gives you a wider variety of tools so you know what i you know i don't remember a lot of algebra or i don't remember a lot of my computer programming stuff but you know what i learned a little bit of logic now i'm going to use an example from university i learned a little bit about logic in, in university but yeah. that was only uh, f- I, I could only do that because I was exposed to logical operators in my computer engineering course in high school, and then later on at my job at the gambling lab when I had to salvage a, 
a, day, a study because our simulator went wrong for half a day and I had to figure out why I had to use my experience with Boolean logic operators which helped me understand formal logic which helped me to read the syntax of a computer code to be able to understand it enough to find the specific outputs in the simulator that allowed me to save data so we didn't have to scrap the entire day's worth of data like 19 or 20 participants yeah. we could only exclude the four or five people that went on the one specific simulator now that's a, that's an example i'm stitching together as a really nice example but what i'm trying to the point i'm trying to drive is that you never know what tools are going to be useful and you never know what tools are going to be able to be adapted to other things i mean the idea of like uh, when you have a hammer all Everything problems looks are like a nail. nail kind of deal like that but you know that kind of misses the other side that hammers are useful for other things as well i mean it's not as you could build a house or crack a skull yeah, I know it's it's uh, it's perhaps a, a flawed metaphor. I'm reaching a little bit too far, but it gives you ways of approaching problems from new way uh, from new angles, and it um, it allows you to reason analogically as well as logically. You can yeah. approach a problem indirectly from another point of view simply by being exposed to something else in another field. I mean, that's a lot of times how a lot of innovations start. It's a, a some sort of you know metaphorical conceptual breakthrough that allows them to then okay i have this as a framework let me go back now and try to make it work for the you know the the science of it you know i also um, like i like that some of the problems are artificially created by the school huh? I, I use the example of random assholes um you put a whole bunch of people in a room and the only thing they have in common is like the vague location where they live mm -hmm. and the year that they were born you're gonna get a reasonably random selection of humanity in this room you're gonna get people from different cultures you're gonna get people from you know who are who are um who are you know first second generation you you know etc you're gonna get people who speak different languages you are going i mean this is this is i i say this as having lived in like city center for most of my life so mm -hmm the area around here is pretty diverse but you are going to what you're going to get is sort of a sampling of the area that you are in i definitely know people who who went to school you know out in the country or in other areas of the city where like everyone is white mm -hmm. which uh seems seems a little unfortunate but what are you going to do when you've got like like no one else is in control of that no. the nice thing about it for for school officials and things like that is they don't have to like vet people to put them in classes together and sometimes they, tr they you know you, you sort of try and you sort of tweak that a bit but you know you always wind up with the sort of this random selection of kids who who are going to present different problems to each other and different social problems and things like that and i, I like speaking as someone who was terrible at negotiating those kinds of things um like like just often paralyzed with fear i do not want to say that they were the best days of my life because they were certainly not but i appreciate so now some of the things that i that i that at the very least i i, I could have learned from that and could have carried forward sooner had i been ready and it is it is it is they are only things that i could learn from unfettered action access to the human race like i i needed to it to be unmediated by you know authority figures or parents or or whoever i needed i needed to learn what it was like to interact with real random people because that is what basically the rest of my life is like i mean you can't always hang out with your friends all the time. Sometimes you're going to interact with people and they might be jerks. And maybe it's because they're jerks. Maybe it's because they're having a really bad day. Or maybe it's because they're in, like, you have no way of knowing. You have no insight into that mm -hmm. unless you get some. And you just sort of got to figure out how to handle that. And that is a thing that hopefully we learn at, at young ages because it is going to be a reality. If we sort of mediate kids contact constantly then it's I, I think it gets harder to learn as somebody for whom it was already very difficult to learn um i don't know that i would have been rewarded by that so yeah the the random social selection 
seems stupid. And probably, like, there's definitely better ways to organize social uh, dynamics. But A, they would take a lot more work. And B, you know, the randomness of it is sort of, like, the, the crapshoot nature is part of its virtue. Because it gets you a complete crapshoot. Which is much like getting a job somewhere. I mean, not always. I mean, you often sort of, you want to try and find a company that, or, or a business that fits your values and things like that. Right, right. And so but you're going to have a few things, and you know, you're going to have things in common. You will definitely have more things in common with people at your work usually than with people that you went to school with. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, you were at least in the same line of work. Yep. But th- there's, there's, a, there's something to be said for just like being able to interact with random pieces of humanity. And being able to recognize their needs, and being able to recognize them as different people, and yeah, it is it is a thing that I, I'm not gonna like toot the the schools develop social skills horn too too loudly, but it is a thing that is often valuable, but also occasionally deeply unfortunate. I mean, that is where you get instances of 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 bullying and harassment and mm. you know suicides and there are there are definitely I don't want to refer to suicides as kinks no because that seems horrible like, like as in like a kinks in a plan um, I think that seems horrible but there are there are there are I also don't want to use the word inevitable no but there are deep flaws in that kind of organization. Um, that stretch back like that stretch through our culture because the reason why kids do that is because they learned it from us and from our media and from our things they are they are living in the world that was built for them but yeah i also like c students we'll do a separate video about that i love c students yeah we also didn't get a chance, and we should probably allude to this for a future video. I really liked our discussion about why teaching budgets and teaching voting is such a hard issue to next, do. In a no, 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 no. Next season. That's for next season. Well, that's we can do school, that next season. That's our school talk for next season. Yeah. Don't for don't foreshadow. Don't foreshadow. Now you're committed yeah. us. Okay, maybe not. No, not next. Not next episode. But that you know what? No, I'm, next season. Next yeah. season. But just beware. There's a conversation coming. It is really interesting on why the idea of why didn't I learn how to budget? Why didn't I learn how to vote in school? Why that is such a, a hard question to answer. Also, if you want to know why you, or some of those things, why you didn't learn them, go back and read and, and, and watch or listen to our skills podcast mm-hmm. where we talked about the difference between something that is useful and something that is important. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't learn astrophysics because it's useful. We don't study astrophysics because it's like, you know, or astronomy because it's immediately useful. The Hubble t- Space Telescope doesn't take pictures of things and transmit them to Earth because we're like, wow, now we're going to build a car with these pictures. It takes pictures of those things and sends them back to the Earth, not because they're useful, but because they matter. Mm-hmm. Because they tell us things about the universe that we live in. Mm-hmm. Things that are awesome. Speaking of awesome, I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And we're signing off. Stay awesome. But you know what? I like the fact that we've actually, for the first time, set up a topic in the future. Oh, God. Really? Because that terrifies me. Well, I mean, it terrifies me, too, but it's also kind of exciting. We're evolving as a podcast. Well, yeah.